All right, it is good to be here again today. Thankful that the Lord has brought us together. We got a few missing. Uh, we'll, we'll be thankful when the Lord uh, uh, has us all back together again. But we are, we are again thankful to be here. Continue to pray uh, for those that um, are not feeling well. We've got, uh, we've got a lot of sickness passing around and just uh, pray the Lord would provide uh, healing and quick healing for that. And uh, again, we got a few that aren't able to be with us today. Just continue to pray for them, okay? Uh, again, quick update. Uh, we do have the lease agreement. Uh, I have it signed, but I have not sent it in yet. So that is the last step. Um, and that would renew uh, our lease for the, the building here for another two years. Uh, that is extending it past the end of March. So we still have some on this lease um, this lease goes to the end of March, and then after that we have, we'll have an extension for the next two years. So thankful for that. Again, it's a blessing um, to know that the, the, there's been some additional work to soundproof the one wall over here, and that uh, potentially our new, our new neighbors are going to be somebody that uh, wouldn't be conflicting with our time. So that is an answer to prayer. So continue to... Uh, go to Lord in prayer, thinking about uh, how we can reach the community here and continue to extend um, that work in this area. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We are going to be back in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20. Of course, we have covered a lot of ground uh, talking about the different uses of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Now today, this morning anyways, uh, we're actually not going to hit any of those verses, but we do want to wrap up all the things that are being talked about in chapter 20. Uh, of course, uh, we talked about last time, um, the first half of Matthew chapter 20 is dealing with the laborers in the vineyard and this idea of the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Uh, which, as I pointed out, is actually an extension of what was talked about in the prior chapter, right? Because in chapter 19, when we saw the rich young ruler and how he came to the Lord and uh, he wanted to know what good thing he could do to inherit eternal life, and uh, the Lord talks about some of that, and he goes away very sorrowful because he don't want to sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ. And, of course, Peter, after a little bit of that dialogue, kind of raises his hand and says, well, what about us that did sacrifice everything? What do we get? Uh, and then that's when the Lord does talk to him about the, the 12 would, would rule with him with 12, on 12 thrones. But he also says, but the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And then he goes into this big discussion about uh, the laborer and, the, and some of that again you see the people that were hired at the beginning of the day and agreed to a penny they got a penny but the guy that got hired at the end of the day and only put in an hour's worth of work got a penny and the Lord said hey look the gifts and the things that are mine to give are mine to give and I'm going to give them the way that I see fit that's kind of what we talked about last time now we're really this morning um I know myself well enough to know that we're probably only going to get about three verses done uh, this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 17, 18, and 19. Now, it seems as if after this discussion about the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, the Lord says in uh, verse 17, And Jesus going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them. Now understand, they are traveling to Jerusalem and it seems as if as they're traveling, as they're on the way at some point, whether it was a rest stop or a break or whether he just pulled these twelve off from whatever other entourage was there, it says that he pulled them off to the side. He pulled the twelve, specifically the twelve, and he pulls them off to the side and he has something to tell them. It says in verse 18, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, to crucify, and the third day he shall rise again. Now listen, this is actually not the first time that the Lord Jesus Christ has talked to them about this. Uh, 
Matter of fact, it seems like he's been ramping up his conversation with them. We actually saw it in verse, I think it was chapter 16, where it says that he began to teach his disciples that he must suffer and die and raise again the third day. And then in chapter 17, he told them again that he was going to have to die and he was going to have to suffer and he was going to be betrayed and he was going to raise again the third day. This is like the third time. I don't know that maybe it's not even more than that because in chapter 16 it says, and began Jesus to teach them. So I don't know how many times, but at least three in the last few chapters, the Lord has told his disciples I am going to be betrayed. I am going to suffer. I am going to die, and I am going to raise again. Now, the Bible here in Matthew doesn't really recount their reactions to this, but let's back up just a little bit, and let's remember how they reacted the first time Jesus did this. I don't know if you remember. Um, let's just turn back there. I wasn't going to, but let me see if I can find this. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the image, the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You remember the first time Jesus started teaching this? Look, there's coming a time I am going to have to go to Jerusalem. And there will be a time when I go to Jerusalem that I am crucified and die. Listen, this is not the first time Jesus Christ has been to Jerusalem. He's been several times. At this point when he tells them, I don't even think at this point he's on his way to Jerusalem yet. But he says, listen, there is coming a time when I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. You would wonder, like, hey, this is the Messiah. This is the guy that they know, he's they know he's from God. They know the power that he has. They know he can prophesy. They've seen it. So why is the reaction so negative to it? Well, I mean, come on. He's talking about dying. That's a negative thing. Yeah, but this is the one that you've placed your faith and trust in and that you believe in. But listen... And I don't think we quite grasp this because we are after the death of Christ looking back on it. This idea of Jesus Christ suffering and dying and having to be buried is so not what these people had been raised with. They think about the Messiah coming and starting his kingdom, and the Old Testament talks about that it will last forever and cover the whole world. And it will. But that's not why he came right now. But when they think about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God coming to be, I know they have a hard time separating the physical kingdom from the spiritual side of things. And that's why you see Paul's reaction of, this will not happen to you. I won't let it. And Peter had to be told, if you have that attitude, then you desire the things of man more than you desire the things of God. Now, it does seem like there's a little bit of a repeat reprieve Peter, uh, Jesus says these things, Peter reprimands him, Jesus reprimands Peter, and then there's a little bit of time where the Lord goes and does some of the things that he does, and then the next thing you know, he's talking about it again. Matter of fact, chapter 17, one chapter over. 
And while they abode, this is verse 22, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Uh, we actually know uh, as we compare Matthew to Mark and Luke, uh, Luke and Mark expand on this statement, and they were exceeding sorry. Mark tells us, uh, and I'll just give you this reference, you don't have to turn there, but Mark chapter 9, verse 32, but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. And then Luke 9 verse 45 but they understood not the saying and it was hid from them that they perceived it not and they feared to ask him of that saying Jesus told them before they they're in Galilee they're not even on their way to Jerusalem Jesus is again telling them I am going to have to suffer and die the first time it's open rebuke to those statements the second time, they're sorrowful and afraid and confused and don't understand what he's talking about. You, you would sit here, we would sit here and go, what's wrong with them? I mean, come on. How more specific can he get? I mean, he just said, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I'm going to raise again. And they might have got pieces of it, but like they just didn't get it. Like I, I, that, I don't, even if they fathomed the fact that he would die, like I still believe that they imagined that when he rose again, he would just set up his earthly kingdom. Like boom, like it's done, right? But we know that even though Jesus was trying to tell them, Jesus was working on preparing them, they just didn't get it yet. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that some of the things that Jesus taught them, they actually didn't get until after the Lord was raised from the dead. And then it's like, oh, I get it now. I understand. Honestly, guys, it really makes me wonder how much of the remaining prophecy that's out there that we just, we think we get it. Like, yeah, I got it. I get it. And then, like, we're going to look back on it and go, oh, I get it now. Right? He's told us. Matter of fact, a lot of the prophecy yet to come, he may have even told us a couple times in a couple different ways. And then afterwards, we're going to go, oh, okay, I understand. It's really easy to look at these guys and go, oh, man, what's wrong with them? But listen, I don't know that we would have been any different. Um, man, we were raised to look for the Messiah. We were raised to think about him coming and setting up his kingdom and providing deliverance. And I think that by now they understood that it wasn't all going to be the way they thought it was. Right? There's a lot of things Jesus has showed them that's different than maybe what they anticipated. But I think as you look at the life of the apostles, even this close to the end of the Lord's ministry, they still very much had a physical, worldly, kingdom mindset. It's actually why they were still arguing and debating with each other about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's why they didn't understand why the Lord said, look at how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. They didn't understand just like so many times we don't understand some things and the Lord keeps teaching and he keeps teaching and he keeps revealing a little bit more to us you know what they got it they do eventually get it and after the Lord's resurrection and after they're filled with the Holy Ghost man you see a people that are on fire for him and you would think well how could they be their leader is gone he said he was gonna die and he's gonna raise again he did die he did raise again and then he left which had to be again so different than what they expected but they had faith and trust 
in their Savior. And if he said, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back, okay. Right? That's the attitude that we need to have. Lord, it may not be what I thought. This is not turning out at all like I anticipated. This is not what I envisioned. But okay. Okay, Lord. If this is what you want, if this is what you have planned, this is what we'll do. We don't want to be like Peter was the first time. Lord, that might be what you think you want, but I'm not going to let that happen. No, that's not the right attitude. That's not the right attitude at all. So as we get in here to chapter 20 and we read these verses, he gives them a little bit more detail. And listen, do you know how scary these words would be? We are on our way to Jerusalem. I want you guys to use your imagination. You've been hearing the Lord talk about how that there's coming a time when he is going to have to be uh, suffer. He's going to suffer and he's going to be crucified and he's going to die. And then the next time he says, it's going to be in Jerusalem. And now the third time he tells you, you're on the road to Jerusalem. Listen, this is not a message of Jerusalem's a dangerous place, and if we're not careful, this will happen. That's not what this message is. This message is, we're on our way to Jerusalem, and when we get there, I am going to suffer, and I am going to be captured, I am going to be beaten, I am going to be mocked, I am going to be killed. We're on our way, guys. At first, it's just some future thing. And then it's some future thing that's going to happen in Jerusalem. And now it's time, guys. Do you remember what I've been telling you? And now that we're on the outskirts of Jerusalem, it's important that you remember what I told you. Listen, again, this is no high-level conceptually this could happen. These are, I'm going to say it this way, this is prophecy. He is actually declaring before it happens very specifically what's going to happen. Listen to his words. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed. This is no longer a future Someday, this is, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed. Unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. Betrayed, who it's betrayed to, condemned to death. That's the picture of a trial. That's the picture of judgment being cast. Delivered. To the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, crucified, raised again. Listen, that's pretty specific. You're on the way to Jerusalem with the one that you have dedicated your life to. The one that you believe is about to set up his kingdom and deliver you. And now, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, you're being told, it's here. And it's this specific. Jesus knows as he goes into Jerusalem. This is no surprise to him. Listen, when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, it was not a surprise. He knew it. He went to Jerusalem knowing what was going to happen. Again, not even knowing some generic thing that, oh, I have to suffer. No, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be condemned in a court. I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles. I'm going to be spat on. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be crucified. You know, sometimes... 
we see some difficult things ahead of us and some things that we need to do. And it's hard because we know it could be dangerous. We, we know and it's difficult because things could go wrong. Jesus Christ boldly and freely of his own will walked into Jerusalem knowing that within days he would be scourged, beat with a whip that would tear the flesh off of his body. Knew that he would be mocked and crucified. When the Bible says that he died for us while we were yet enemies, he died for us knowing it was going to happen. You know, there are some people that put their life on the line for others. They put their life on the line for others, willing to die, hoping they won't. <laughs> Jesus Christ went into Jerusalem knowing he was going to die for our sins. And I will once again say that I personally believe that the physical torment that Jesus went through was nothing compared to actually bearing our sins and being forsaken by the Father. We can associate somewhat with the physical pain. The physical pain was just a fraction of what Christ went through on the cross. And he did that because you are a sinner. And he did it willingly. Now these are the things that Jesus Christ declares. Betrayed to the chief priest, condemned, delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, crucified, raised again. That's in chapter 20. Now he does a lot of teaching. There's very few days actually I believe there's very few days between verse 17, 18, and 19 and when Jesus Christ is crucified. Very few. But there's a lot of content that's still covered, okay? I mean, by the time you get to chapter 21, we start to talk about the uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, the cleansing of the temple, the second cleansing of the temple. Uh, Jesus Christ... Uh, gives some parables at the end of chapter 21, the parable of two sons, the parable of the tenants. You got in chapter 22, the parable of the wedding feast. Uh, you've got the concept of paying taxes to, to Caesar. And these are all things that we'll go into in the coming weeks. <laughs> There's this discussion with the Sadducees about the resurrection. There's some discussion about what the greatest commandment is. There's some discussion about who do you think the Christ is. Chapter 23, you see this declaration of the woes or the judgment described to the scribes and the Pharisees. That's in chapter 23. You see in the bottom half of chapter 23, verse, chapter, uh, 23 starting verse 37, Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. Chapter 24, Jesus foretelling the destruction of the temple. Chapter 24, the signs of the end of the age, the abomination of desolation, the coming of the Son of Man. No one knows the day or the hour. These are all very familiar passages. Chapter 25 is the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, some discussion about judgment. And then when you get to chapter 26, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Jesus tells them as they're going into Jerusalem, there's some back and forth. Jesus is doing some teaching. At the end of those teachings, he says, the time is at hand. You see in verse, uh, in the rest of chapter 26, Jesus anointed at Bethany. And then in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 26, 
Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So, chapter 20, as they're walking toward Jerusalem, Jesus tells them, I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests. What just happened in chapter 26? Judas goes to the chief priests makes a bargain with them, and starts to look for an opportunity where he can betray the Lord. The first part of Jesus' prophecy of telling about his death has just come to pass. Exactly the way he said it would. Betrayed. The idea of being betrayed, listen, it's not just that somebody tells the authorities where you're at. That's not betrayal. Betrayal is the idea of somebody that is with you. Somebody that you trust turns on you. And now that's happened. Exactly the way Jesus said it would. We see that they go through the Passover, the Lord's Supper. Jesus uh, foretells about Peter's denial. Uh, there's Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. This is all again here in chapter 26. The bottom half of chapter 26, And while he yet spake, this is verse 47, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. Listen, you know what you just saw? This is Peter, by the way. Remember what happened the first time Jesus said, I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to crucify and die? Peter rebuked him and said, I won't let it happen. Now, Peter was rebuked in return and said, if you feel that way, you desire the things of man more than the things of God. And yet, when it came time, what did Peter do? He grabbed his sword and he fought back. Peter still had some things to learn. Peter, beyond this point, was going to actually begin to deny Christ at, at not too far from here. But things are in motion. You see here in verse 57, and they, and they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. You see this discussion. Verse 59, they sought false witness against him to put him to death, but none was found in verse 60. Verse 61, somebody said he claimed to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The, in verse 62, the high priest basically said, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his, cl his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. So what did Jesus say? He said that I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests, and I will be condemned to death. That idea of being condemned to death, again, brings with it that there would be a trial and a passing of sentence. Now, we can debate whether this trial would... I don't even think it's a debate. Was this trial a legitimate trial is another discussion. But condemned to death brings with it the idea of judgment being passed. What did you just see? Judgment was just passed that he's guilty and worthy of death. 
the second part of Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled right there in Matthew chapter 26, verse 66. But it doesn't stop there. It says, Then said, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Jesus actually said back there in Matthew chapter 20 that they will spit on me. What did they just do? They condemned him to death. They began to mock him and they spat on him. That is so specific. Listen, you could say Jesus knew it was going to be trouble going to Jerusalem. Was it really a prophecy? They were already trying to get him. He was just guessing that they were going to get him and he might die. Listen, he knew they would spit on him. That is really specific. We see there in the latter half of chapter 26 that Peter, Peter denies the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 27, it says in verse 1, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him unto Pontius Pilate, the governor. What did he say back in Matthew chapter 20? I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests. I'm going to be condemned to death. I'm going to be delivered to the what? The Gentiles. What did they just do? They literally just brought Jesus Christ to the leading Gentile in Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate. This is the guy that can execute judgment. And he just happens to be a Gentile. Listen, if this was simply the Lord looking ahead, thinking and anticipating this might happen, this could happen, it's probably going to happen, they're really worked up, they hate me a whole lot, I know they're capable of it. But yet he knew they were going to spit on him. He knew that it was going to come through betrayal. Listen, they... If you look at what happened to Stephen, they didn't deliver Stephen to the Gentiles to be crucified. They stoned him with their own hands. Now, there's a lot of maybe debate as to whether or not they had the authority to do that. But listen, they weren't above it. So this was just Jesus anticipating well, man, he knew that they weren't just going to take him and kill him. They were literally going to deliver him to the Gentiles. And you see that prophesy, or that prophecy fulfilled here in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 27. You see Jesus, uh, Judas hangs himself here in this chapter. Uh, you see this discussion in the, in the middle of Matthew chapter 27 where Jesus is standing before Pilate and there's some back and forth there. Uh, we see where uh, there, that Pilate doesn't want anything to do with this and he, he offers to have, uh, do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And, and the crowd chooses Barabbas and they want Jesus Christ, what? Crucified. It says... In verse 22, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with this, with this Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Do you see how specific Christ's declaration was in Matthew chapter 20? Check mark, check mark. I mean, literally, he just, he, he tells his, his disciples, his apostles, this is going to happen, 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 this is going to happen. And as you go through these verses, step by step, you see them very specifically fulfilled. Verse 24, you actually see where Pilate, uh, in those next few verses, listen, when Pilate saw 
that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What did Matthew chapter 20 say? Well, they're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to scourge me. That just got fulfilled. Verse 27, I think, is more of the fulfillment of the mockery. The Jews mocked him early, but this is even a more open and public thing here. Verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus under the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. You find in verse 35, And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mocked, spat upon, scourged, crucified. And you find here in verse 45, And now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see Jesus Christ here hanging on the cross. There's some more fulfillment of Scripture. But in verse 50, But Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. By the way, some of the apostles were apparently in the crowd watching. They were watching this one who John the Baptist had declared, Behold the Lamb of God! And they started sitting at his feet, hearing his teachings. They understood that he was the Messiah, the one that was to come, the one that would really, truly implement the kingdom of God. And they draw closer to him, and they learn more about him, and they grow, and they're starting to see prophecy fulfilled, and they're seeing amazing miracles. They're given power themselves to do amazing miracles. And yet now, in total shock and seems to be disbelief whenever you recognize Peter's reaction to it and all of them abandoning him. And now they're standing there and he's bleeding and he's naked and he's being mocked openly and he's dying. The words of Peter, I'm not going to let this happen. But it did. It seems like defeat. We've talked about this before. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ seems like defeat. And we look back on it now. After Christ died, after Christ has risen again, after we've seen even more prophecy fulfilled, and we don't maybe struggle with that concept as much. Can you imagine being before all that? And the prophecy not coming out quite the way you thought it was going to? And now they're seeing this one 
that they have worshipped. Because that's honestly, as you look at what they've done, they have worshipped him. They have placed all their trust in him. They've sacrificed their livelihoods and their well-being for him. And now he's beaten and battered and bleeding and dying. Just like he told him he would. Now, I don't know at what point. It seems like not till the very end. I mean, listen, Jesus Christ told them what, and we've seen it all fulfilled with his death except one piece. I'm going to be betrayed. That happened. To the chief priest. That happened. Condemned to death. That happened. Mocked. Scourged. Turned over to the Gentiles crucified but there's one piece left raise again the third day now it's interesting to me when you look at the disciples and the apostles at this point you almost get the impression that they forgot about the last piece Listen, they are caring for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe even some secret disciples there that take the body down and prepare it for burial. And then it gets buried. But it's interesting to me that later on in this discussion, because um, here in verse 57 through 61, you see Jesus uh, buried. There's guards placed at the tomb. But then when you get to chapter 28, you see where the Lord was risen from the dead. <coughs> Listen. Verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, but toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and it sat, up, it sat upon. And his countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not. For, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he, as he, as he what? As he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and, quick, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, go forth before you into Galilee, and, and he goeth forth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with, great, with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now, as we read some of the other accounts and some of the other gospels, we actually find that when they go and tell, uh, like Peter and John, um, they run and they stick their head in and it's almost like they're confused. What am I saying? I'm saying that as they stood watching Christ be crucified, they still didn't get it. Even then, everything he said was checked off exactly. And yet that last piece, and the angel of the Lord even tells them, as he said, But they almost seem surprised when Jesus raises from the dead. We can look at them and we can wonder and we can shake a finger at them. But you know, I wonder sometimes how much our faith is like that. The Lord has provided deliverance for us. He saved us when we didn't deserve it. He's promised He's coming back. He's promised He's going to be with us. And yet, day by day, 
even after having seen this prophecy fulfilled and this prophecy fulfilled and him answer this prayer and him answer this prayer, we just seem surprised sometimes when he does what he says he's going to do. Be careful looking down your long nose at the 12 apostles. Their earth, their, their, their perception of everything they had looked forward to had just been shattered. And yet sometimes with us, we doubt in something so much smaller. You know what we need to do? We need to remember the words of the Lord. What did they have to be reminded of? As he said. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. We need to make sure that we are always going back to the word of God. Dwelling on it. Meditating on it. Praying about it. We need to be rooted and grounded in scriptures. And when we start to heal, hear and feel those doubts assail us. Remember the words that he said. His promises will be fulfilled perfectly. It wasn't just that Jesus got all of them right, but the last one. He got them all right. It may take longer than we anticipate. It may work out different than we anticipate. But it will work out exactly the way he planned it. Remember his words. Remember his words. We um, don't necessarily have time to go into any more, but I, mean, I think we've kind of covered this fairly well here. You see in those three verses where Jesus Christ literally lays it out step by step, everything that's going to happen. And then as you get into Matthew 26, 27, and 28, that's exactly how it happened. We serve a God who knows everything and His plan will be fulfilled perfectly. We need to live our lives like we believe that. I can't even begin to imagine what they must have felt like walking into Jerusalem after having heard the Lord Jesus Christ talk about all this stuff. And then what they must have felt like as they started to see some of this stuff unfold And then to be standing there to see this great one that you've been worshiping dying in front of you. But then how miraculous it must have been to see the risen Savior. The one that had done things that you couldn't even imagine were possible. does something even more miraculous than any of those other things you've seen. It's one thing to raise somebody else from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful, wonderful Savior that we serve. All right, we're going to end there. Brother Philip, if you would, come and lead us in a song, please.